So good morning, everyone. I'm Linda Jackson, and I'm the president and founder of the Association for Community Empowerment Solutions, ACES World. And on behalf of our team, I would like to welcome you to our series of conversations about girls' education. ACES World works to support women and girls in Colombia, Uganda, and Ghana. And we work toward gender equality and supporting women and girls to achieve their full potential. We also founded the Gender Equality Data Collaborative to assist member NGOs with data collection, monitoring, and evaluation. The GEDC currently has 50, 50 member organizations in 10 countries. If you have any questions, we welcome you to place them in the chat as we proceed. And just to begin, Surya, we are so pleased to host this conversation with you. Um, Surya has dedicated his life to education and children and is convinced that education is the only tool to get Nepalese, the Nepalese out of poverty. He is the country director and co-founder of United World Schools in Nepal and leads the in-country team to ensure project development and project innovation. Since UWS Nepal's establishment in 2015, the organization has opened 34 schools providing free education to 5,200 children living in rural Nepal. For his work in education um, and sustainable development, in 2014, Surya was awarded the Prince of Wales and Unilever Sustainable Living Young Entrepreneur Award and subsequently went to um, United World College of Venezuela, finished your undergraduate in the U.S., and completed your master's in So what made this possible for you? Um, um, well, I, I think I, when you were saying all of that, I was like I was reflecting back on, on, on that particular journey. Um, as I sit in a lockdown right now, uh, the, the, this afternoon I was reflecting on it. Um, so I, I basically, you know, was born, like you said, uh, into a very poor family, to a single mother, and specifically in Nepal to be born into, uh, born to women who doesn't have a male support. In those times when I was born, which is 1990, um, it meant uh, a future that was uh, not secure. And it also meant uh, a future that was filled with uncertainties. Um, I mean, I think it was a women that really, you know, women, as in my mother, that really thought that possibilities were there, but that the only way out was education. Uh, and education in my village meant uh, walking two and a half hours. Uh, you know, you just said that two and a half hours. That was like the craziest walks. You had to go down the hill and then from there walk straight to the school. Um, uh, crossing two rivers, which which was which was an interesting walk in itself, because my mom dragged me to school, like literally dragged me. Like if you can imagine a person being dragged and you're literally crawling back so that you don't you don't you don't want to go to school, like your mom is actually dragging by your leg or by your hand. Um, I I I hated school back then. I didn't know what schooling was for because that was what was shown. Like the school that I went to, or the school that majority of us went to in, uh, back then. Uh, didn't really show the meaning of education, didn't really show why you went to school, didn't really make you feel like going to school was anything more than just going to school. Um, because everybody, every example that was around us uh, ended up in the same place, whether you went to school or not. So the same place I meant uh, everybody in my village, in my family, everybody around me, uh, the farthest future they ever had was building stadiums or houses in Qatar. Uh, Saudi, Malaysia, and all of those places. So whether you went to school or not, the same, you ended in the same place. So some days there were times when I went fishing. Some days there were times I came home. Just by the time you got to school, my mom would leave me in the school, and I would get back from get home, leaving the school from the back window. So we were quite a lot of uh, children in there, and then the teacher wasn't paying attention. So yeah, just to give you a summary, I think that's what it was. But my mom was very determined. Um, my life, uh, my life was set on 15 cents. I always talk about the precious 15 cents, which was my mom uh, heard of a heard of an education opportunity on radio, so she listened to radios a lot, 
and uh, we had to walk for 28 hours uh, to go give the exam and, and from there life changed um i got you know i got an opportunity to leave my village rather than an opportunity i was forced to leave my village so um you know away from home for nine years not seeing my mom i lived a life that transformed myself and uh you know i get to i get to share that story but there are thousands of uh, those children that you know didn't get that same opportunity and so you know being a being a fortunate person born to a single mother uh in an underprivileged family uh despite coming from a privileged background i'd say which is basically in terms of uh, being born into an ethnic group that was that's, that's slightly more privileged than most ethnic groups uh, that's a very different uh, place to be so you know just getting that access to education transformed everything and from there on no opportunities came along way uh education you know if if anybody asks what education does i would say it does it does me um so uh but yeah no just uh, that's my background and my love for education if you really ask uh, it's it's very simple uh, i think I, my mom is very proud that i i've done something but uh, that that hit me on the reverse which was um she's proud i got an access to education and then it hit me that there were hundreds of them doing that exam where only one was selected and then as i tracked back to see who, what were they doing uh, it it was uh, very disheartening to know that you know not everybody had a future like mine so uh, yeah that's that's what my love for education started but primarily because people invested in me and uh, the return on investment was that i could do something for this for, for the people that really lived my life lived my past and uh, it's it's their present but yeah thank you So I I know that often times our conversation about countries begin with kind of focusing on the problems in the country and so during this conversation we will talk about those problems but I also wanted to begin by giving you an opportunity to talk about what you think the world should know about Nepal and its people. Um I guess it's very simple we we are one of the coolest people as linda would say i mean you know, we we had a very good not this kid um nepal uh we we're known for mountains but to be honest i think it's more of the people that we'd want to be known for um you know really hard working farmers to really dedicated you know laborers uh, the country is sustained on remittances it's a country dependent on completely people working abroad in different parts of the world and imagining a country without those people is is absolutely you know not a possibility so hard working people absolutely dedicated wonderful um citizens who want a future for themselves who want a better future for their families um and in a very welcoming i would definitely say that the positive aspect is that we are we're very welcoming to everybody um we li- we li- we like peace we are very patient um we 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 elect the same officials again and again despite them being very corrupt um we don't trust in educated educated political leaders um uh, we're very divided politically that's something uh to note even women girls boys um edu- uh, politics starts at school school when i say school uh, i would say 8 9 10 11 12 grade that's where politics starts um everybody's fed information um to in the economic economic side i would say we are now officially a lower middle income country which for me sounds really weird considering it's just pushed i don't believe in it but uh, the government decided that we want to go into a lower middle income country so why not just put our name out there previously we were one of those one of the least developed countries in the world uh, that basically meant uh, we were one of the 42 countries that really had low very low income um, in terms of per capita as well as human resource human human development index and all of that um despite that you have one of those one of the brightest minds around the world from different companies to nasa to any you can imagine of where you find them at least but uh, we also have people in, in america i imagine imagine where how far we've gone right like a country of 30 million people um but the grim fact is there's quite a lot of problems uh, you know while there is hope in tourism while there is hope in industry while there is hope in the remittance sector there is hope in people imagining of a future away from poverty and all of that i think there is quite a lot of work to do so a country filled with happiness a country completely isolated in terms of how politics is done we controlled by the outer world uh, but we are a country loved by you know people from around the world uh, we just graduated from the least developed country so i always talk about that yeah. 
So that was good because one of my questions actually related to that, but I wanted to kind of take a side question to respond to something you said. You were talking about remittances, and I wonder during the time of the pandemic, how has that influenced remittances to Nepal? Um, so the first, I would say the first lockdown, uh, when, when the pandemic really started in 2020, we definitely had uh, the remittance sector really hit hard because the countries that were the primary recipients of our labor um, had themselves shut down. So nothing was being paid and people were not sending money. But as the vaccination drive has continued on in the Gulf states and as well as in Malaysia, our remittance sector hasn't been, uh, it's, it's actually growing. Um, so in the economic side, I would say the country whose 32% of the whole economy depends on remittance, we're, we're sort of secure on that side. Um, unless there's a recession or another pandemic in, in the country that, that supply, that take all our labor, we are good to go for now. But uh, with the with uh, with the in country in country you know uh, income that we make out of tourism and all of the other industries, we're definitely at really hard. So I'm I'm kind of curious to to understand. So I was when I was researching Nepal and trying to learn more about Nepal. I realized that there was a 10 year civil war, which I wasn't aware of, that there was a massive earthquake in 2015, which I was aware of. And then looking at the pandemic and you've talked about how Nepal has been able to lift itself out of being one of the least developed countries to um, out of that status. So what do you think um, a, you can attribute that success to? Um. So we are, I, I also at times call my country a country unlucky in terms of we get all the disasters, all the disasters that could be gifted. Um, we had a 10 year long civil war. Um, it's uh, The civil war stemmed out of the fact that there was quite a lot of discrimination and people wanted equality and wanted to throw the autocratic rule of the king and all of that. And there's quite a lot of background work that was being done. There's also a you know, conspiracy that was fueled by India because there's quite a lot of interest and all of that. Well, not going into that, I can definitely say you that despite all of the different, uh, you know, disasters as well as um, uncertainties, instabilities that we go through, we've definitely, I, I'd say our commitment to the first round of MDGs, which is the Millennium Development Goals, uh, that was that was one of the factors for us to uh, that really pushed um, the whole country's economy as well as our indicators to become a lower income country, then lower middle income country. Then um, another factor I would really say is investment in education. I'd say the government has invested quite a quite a lot in education, but though it, it hasn't yielded anything, I would say there there is investment. Fourteen percent of the whole budget goes to um, goes to education. And and I while that is true, the whole population believes in the fact that education is is transformative. Now, is that accessible to everybody? That that question is different. Uh, but for now, I would definitely put it out to education and also sort of foreign direct investment that has slowly started to come to the country in the hydro energy sector, which is uh, considering we are the second richest um, country in uh, freshwater. Um, it is sort of expected that you know with the climate change and everything, we benefit quite a lot. So. Um, but is is that going to be beneficial in the future? Not really. But for now, that's you know the country's uh, ascent to lower middle income country. I would definitely say education, um, education, and also our commitment to commitment to the MDGs, which is you know which is which is a key driver, and and also uh, definitely to our foreign direct investment in different different sectors in the country. Thank you. So you mentioned foreign investment, and and I want to kind of piggyback on a conversation that we had with our previous speaker, um, looking at issues of foreign investment. And when you talk about foreign investment, has foreign investment, or from your perspective, been a partnership? Um, and do you think that if foreign investors were no longer in um, Nepal, that the Nepalese people would be able to benefit from having that previous relationship with them? Um. I would say so. The, the investments in Nepal have come in two different ways. I would say the first one would be aid, which is you know aid 
from the U.S. government, the U.S. people, U.K. government, U.K. people, um, and the other one would be foreign direct investment, which is uh, different companies investing in foreign return on investment and all of that. Uh, the two have different facets to it. Um, the aid definitely sometimes comes with strings attached. Um, if the Indian government is providing aid, then it does have strings attached to it. If the U.S. government is providing, then I would definitely say, depending on the political climate, that's how the investments come in. But also, I think primarily U.K. and U.S. and, and many aid agencies have really directed their aid towards the upliftment of human life in Nepal. Without that, it would be very difficult for the country really to get out of get to the situation that we are in currently. Definitely, it has its own drawbacks. Um, you know, at the end of the day, dependency on aid really creates lazy people and we do have those places around the country. Um, it, because there was aid in education, education standard somewhat has improved in terms of infrastructure. Now, the, the investments could have been directed towards quality education, which hasn't been done. Maybe it's the right moment, it's the right moment for that to happen. But aid without strings attached or aid specifically to the upliftment of human human life uh, is, is really good. And the, that partnership, without that partnership, the country wouldn't have gone anywhere. Now, in terms of foreign direct investment, I would say as the country coming in as a least developed country um, and with an economy that's solely dependent on certain industries, as well as being a landlocked country, it is add political instability to that. Anyone coming to invest into this country is taking quite a lot of risk. So, um, so you know, anybody coming into this either looks for really high returns or looks for, you know, uh, really good partnerships within the government or has someone else to partner in the country. Um, so far, the investments definitely are looking to reap rewards, but not to the extent that the long term is going to look good. So the long term doesn't look, look really, really beautiful. In the short term, it looks really nice. With the investments coming in, uh, the policies change, and so therefore the country's situation, you know, more molds towards a more politically stable country. Um, and I think these are two factors that really bring the country forward. Without the foreign direct investments, I wouldn't, or foreign investments in general, I wouldn't say the country would have become so flexible enough to accommodate uh, the kind of policies that we have currently, which is, you know, we, we are a country with one of the best policies in the world. We are one of the first few countries that really accepted third sex. We, we talk about, you know, um, allocated um, proportional representatives of women and all of that. Now, is it implemented? That's a different question. But, like, you know, we've, we've really had people that have, that have brought in investment, both in aid as well as uh, foreign direct investment, that have benefited quite, quite a lot in terms of policies. But, yeah, so they've, they've got its own negative and positive. But definitely without both of them, the country wouldn't have got to a state that it is today. Okay, thank you. So I just before the pandemic, I was just doing a bit of research on girls' access to education. And I f one of the two of the factors that I, you know, found that were, according to the Borgen Project, for example, were that girls experience school-related gender-based violence and also the practice of chapati, which I'm sure I pronounced that wrong, but knowing that it was banned in 2005, um, how has United World School in Nepal been able to overcome some of these cultural barriers that keep girls out of school? Um, I think one of the things really to understand is transforming a system doesn't depend on laws. It's only one of those factors that really helps. Uh, women education, women empowerment in this country is two-faceted. Uh, one is the policy level, another is the culture side. We're, we're very deeply traditionally rooted in terms of, we're deeply traditionally rooted in terms of culture and all of that. So women always have been marginalized, always have been uh, locked up in the house, always been treated as housewives. And so, yeah, you know, and we have three generations of people, one generation that is dying out who treated the women crazily like, you know, um, domestic animals. And then you had uh, this, you have a second generation that sort of realized women were more than just baby bearers or house caretakers. And then you have the other generation that is sort of more understanding 
um, that women should be should go out, but they're more reluctant because they've not really been taught or brought up in that environment. Then we have the current generation that really believes in the opposite direction, which is everybody's individual, you just need to go your way. Um, the dominant force are the first three generations. And so the current generation cannot do much. Um, now, the question of, you know, what, what has it over done? How has, how have women really come out? Um, I was asked this question once upon a, once in a, in a, in another call, um, where they said, uh, why are you investing in the generation that, that's currently, uh, you know, why aren't you investing in the generation that is being exploited or is going through uh, women violence, you know, gender violence or domestic violence? And I basically said, um, the current generation will really require rework of the culture because that's, that's where everything is rooted around the family, everything is rooted around the society. In order to transform that particular thinking, you need to, you know, do it piece by piece. But the generation that is upcoming, you could definitely bring the thought already into the heads and minds of these young children. And so therefore they're prepared for a world where they feel like everybody's important. Now, you gave an example of the child body system, which is basically when you have a menstru menstrual cycle or when you're going through your period, uh, you are required by the family to go and live in a hut uh, that is very small, uh, is locked from the outside, um, and, and then uh, you have that, that whole um, oxygen you know, supply going down, plus, you know, cold and all of that, a lot of issues, hygiene issues and all of that. The government actually, um, a year and a half ago, uh, did a campaign where they were demolishing all of these child bodies, right? My view back then, and still the same, is you can destroy that house, but the mentality of that family still continues to be the same. Either you need to re-educate that family, or expect that the next generation will continue to, you know, rebel and then have the system change. The child body only moved inside the house because now the family actually created a room where these women had to stay. So, but then has, you know, the next generation that is coming after the generation that is really suffering, they, they're, they're definitely having it much more easier. Uh, the families are much more accepting of that. Um, but we still go through that, you know, we, there are, there, those are those are just one part of the problem. There are places in the country where women have it very difficult, very very difficult. Um, and it's not only during the period, uh, like you said, gender violence, uh, domestic violence is one of the biggest issues. I think it was it was highlighted during the first pandemic, first lockdown, that women the domestic violence was in the rise, considering female and male had to live in the same house for a considerable amount of time, um, and so. Um, that is, that is primarily attributed to the fact that uh, male tend to be, you know, they, they tend to think that they, they do everything and they earn for the family and that women just sit and do nothing, which is, which is not really true, but that, that, that experience of women, what do they do? The males do not really have an idea of it. And they tend to think it's really simple to run a family or have that around. So the domestic violence was definitely on the rise. Uh, gender violence, I would say, uh, in majority part of the country, it continues to be a problem, but I don't know if it's uh, really, an, really a sticking problem. The part of um, gender violence that I really, really attribute to uh, or talk about is is this whole sense of, um, you know, threat that males tend to feel, um, considering there's con quite a lot of investment in girls' education right now. And so the balance uh, needs to continue to be, be you know, created uh, for both that cultural mindset to change as well as the new mindset being created by education to come into force. UWS does very simple thing. Uh, we've got 7,000 children in school right now. That's 50 schools. Uh, it's been, uh, actually, it's been six months since I updated that whole information, but We've got over 3,700 children, 3,700 girls, and these 3,700 girls have a future completely different from what their mothers or sisters have. The reason I say so is I've interact, I get to interact with these girls before they start school, and one of the very basic thing I ask is, what is it something that you've really seen that you want to be in life? And when you hear these children say nothing, 
and then you go back in two to three months and they tell you they want to become a teacher, nurse, doctor, engineer. Something that you, you know, you've never seen in these rural areas happen. You know, boys' education is always invested because girls are never considered to be social security investment. What I really mean by that is um, in Nepal, because it is a male-dominated society, family and there is no proper social security system within the country, there is a tendency that after retirement, the family is, ex you know, family son, son is expected to take care of the mother and the father and the grandfather and the granddaughter and all of that. And so females are usually expected to just get married away to someone else. And so families from underprivileged backgrounds, underprivileged groups usually tend to say that why invest in somebody else's social security, right? That's, that's a tendency. That's a mindset that they have. Oh, you know, um, they could, they could have thought that Somebody else is investing in our social security. I could invest in somebody else's. Now there is there are quite a lot of intricate issues within that. So um, from dowry system to quite a lot of things, it's expensive and all of that. But uh, thirty seven hundred girls. Um, these girls, you know, my they they have a they're definitely going to be something different than the generation that is above them because they've had access to an education that lets them think freely, that lets them have you know, bathrooms that are friendly and they, they're able to just attend school during period, periods and nobody else makes fun of them. The whole teachers, teachers, one of the most important things that I've seen is the generation that ha that's that been my generation was told by teachers that this is not okay, right? They were not allowed, the girls were not allowed to talk about their periods. They were not allowed to, you know, speak freely about it. And so, I think that is that is to be attributed to the fact that the teachers were not accepting of the fact, right? They were not taught to teach in that particular manner. Whereas now, the generation, like the, the generation of teachers we are training, they're, they're definitely very open to talking about mental health, talking about the changes in physical, physical attributes of girls and boys. And I think creating a safe environment for girls to come in and, and grow, uh, thrive openly, uh, is, is what we've created. Um, that being said, uh, the current problems that women are going through, uh, there's only a ripple effect we are able to create. We're not able to address it directly. Okay, thank you. So earlier in our conversation, you talked about um, social class and and I'll, I'll apologize if none of my statistics are completely up to date, sources are limited, but um, what I found is that about 12% of Dalit women attend secondary school, which is significantly less than other women, which implies that there's a limit in terms of not only gender, but a limit in terms of class to education. Can you talk a little bit about that class system in Nepal, what laws there are, if any, for the protection of Dalits from discrimination? Are they enforced and what strategies have been effective in helping women and girls to overcome those barriers? Um, I mean, like I said from the start, we've got the best laws in the world, I would say. The best of, we've picked the best of different parts of the world. Um, all thanks to the aid agencies or, or the knowledge that was provided by by these, you know, bilateral agencies, um, but uh, they provided us the knowledge. They didn't teach us how to implement it. That's mm -hmm. the, that's one of the biggest problems, I'd say. Uh, imagine someone who knows how to do gender, uh, you know, gender equality, coming to the country and saying, "This is how you write the policy," and then you don't really teach these people how you implement slowly and steadily and with uh, quite a lot of emotion. You know, you get to start thinking about it, it takes time and all of that. I was never taught. And so you you see this we all the policies that get implemented in this country get translated. What I really mean is there's someone else who proposed this is how it should be made. There's someone else who implements it thinking this is how it really reads. Um, it is changing considering there's quite a lot of people uh, quite a lot of people that come from backgrounds that are um, that that have you know they go they go for education abroad they get to uh, they they know quite a lot and come back and help the country now going back to what what the uh, you know discrimination twelve percent and all of that I'll just give you a recent fact which is um, ten percent of girls get married before before fifteen now the legal age is twenty that's the law right 
ten percent of girls get married by by fifteen, uh, and then there's uh, of of uh, the total girls, forty percent have children by by eighteen. Now that basically means forty percent of the total girls in Nepal women in Nepal get married before eighteen. Legal age is twenty, by the way. The the policy says twenty. It's quite a quite a mismatch. Now, why is there a mismatch with the culture? You know, you never. While creating policies, it is important to address the issue of culture. Um, the government is definitely enforcing these laws, creating different. Uh, there's the carrot and the stick that is being played, um, where you know if you if you have uh, if you if you ma- if you marry your daughter before twenty, the family faces jail terms and all of that. Uh, but it takes a whole community to actually say that is wrong. You. Imagine a whole community where they attend the wedding ceremony. Now you could you could think about this, right? There's a wedding ceremony happening, and then she, the girl is 17 year old. Um, everybody attends the wedding, right? Now, according to the law, anyone who attends that wedding is in trouble. But you can only punish so many so many people, right? Because at the end of the day, the, the political system comes back to us for votes in these communities. So wherever. It's just very intricately connected, culture, politics, and all of that uh, implementation of policies. Um, in terms of education and all of that, 20, 12%, that's, that's, I would say that's a hopeful figure um, for me. Um, now, the reason I say that is I think, uh, I, think uh, I look at it in the grand scheme of things. Right now, um, there is a 100% uh, enrollment rate. There is... You know, every girl, every boy, at least in, 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 in the schools, in the communities we work with, plus the government even claims that there's 100% enrollment rate of girls and boys around the country. If not 100, there's 95 to 100%. Now, uh, the, the back end story is they get enrolled on a register, but they don't attend the school. So enrollment is one thing, attending the school is another, retaining them is another. Um, the government policy is that all of the underprivileged families get scholarship supports, right? So cash or resources or scholarships or anything, right? And so as long as that is existent, the families are happy to send. Now, the government does not have infinite resources. And so at some point, they cut it out. When they cut it out, that's when the family loses interest in education because the child hasn't realized the importance of education and the family hasn't seen the benefits of education and so therefore these underprivileged families for example from Dalit families they have they they have to make a choice uh, of keeping their children at home to work with them in somebody else's farm to make a living to survive or send their children to school with not knowing what's going to happen next because eventually they'll even they'll have to get the children married and have a family so why not teach from now and make it better um I think I think the the biggest gap is ensuring that these uh, these families understand the importance of education, the importance of why why education, how far education, where does it get you, what what is the importance? Um, discrimination wise, um, you know, we are I think one of the most inclusive country in terms of in in, in paper. Um, if you're from a very underprivileged, underrepresented group, represented group in the country, you have access. There's, there's there's actually a quota system within everything. So from accessing civil service to accessing services easily to cash handout to everything, right? There's there's a quota system provided for the underprivileged family. The biggest question or the biggest gap is that the group accesses it. But not the one that really needs it. Now that's a that's a different side. The the reason being, these people do not the ones that need it do not know how to process information. They do not they cannot read, write, and count. And so therefore they can't process this information that really was meant for them. Who processes the information? A Dalit who is already a already a wealthy family, right? And so a Dalit who is already a poor family can't access it because they can't process information. And so therefore that's the play where. That's where the education piece comes in. Now, let alone boys, let alone, you know, girls' education is far-fetched. Even boys from underprivileged families from these groups usually do not make it beyond grade eight, which is the end of the primary education. Nepal has a very, very grim, grim figure. 
If 100 children enroll in grade one, only 30 percent, 30 children make it to secondary education. So that is including that's inclusive of everybody, right? The majority of them that make it are from families that are privileged, be it Dalit, be it anyone, right? And so the families that drop out do not realize that they can't really process information. Like even if they, uh, to give you an example, if a woman wants to go work in Kuwait as a caretaker, she can't process information. So by the time, even to go and work as a laborer, she gets, um, she, she actually gets manipulated already in the country, right? She has to pay bribe, she has to do quite a lot of payments and all of that. Whereas that, that would, that, if the person already knew how to process information, the person didn't have to do that. So the upliftment part is the processing of information. And uh, in terms of women representation, just to let you know, we have 33% women in every place, every workforce, right? Now, who accesses that? That's a question to be answered somewhere else. But like, I think you get a gist of who gets it. I do, thank you. So um, just wanted to talk a little bit about the pandemic and how the pandemic has specifically impacted opportunities for women. And, and then to frame that in the context of women who have been able to complete secondary school or post-secondary school, are there pretty, are there specific areas where women have experienced more success? Yeah. Mm. So the pandemic came in at a time where I would say we're just starting on the sustainable development goals implementation that has a huge focus on health education, quality education, work, um, and all of that. Um, women that make it into secondary education do have a future um, that's a lot more brighter than anyone else's. Uh, but with the pandemic, that's a, that's a very grim figure. Um, I, I really don't have a figure back of my mind, but I can definitely tell you that um, the country has seen huge dropout rates both in primary and secondary because the secondary education in Nepal is not free. So secondary education specifically, people have to afford to actually get into workforce. Um, I can I can literally, you know, one of those very few things that I can tell you is I run two schools uh, that are non-profit or not-for-profit sharing schools where we select the girls from all over the country to come and study together, girls and boys. From underprivileged families, and in our very school, um, the girls that made it to secondary education, or majority, everybody makes it to secondary education. But we've seen over eight girls drop out because their families can no longer afford to send them just to the school. So now, let it, let alone tuition, which is free in our schools, they can't really send them to our school because there is some cost involved in it. So the pandemic really has seen quite a big hit in terms of whatever we, we've achieved in girls' education. Because we've we had quite progressive uh, figures in terms of how many girls enrolled, how many girls actually made it to secondary education. When I said twelve percent is a is a progressive, it's it's a it's a it's a hopeful figure. I really meant it because um, because you know this figure is over the past five years. It's an improvement uh, in terms of how many girls actually go to secondary education. Um, so uh, I would definitely say there's been quite a quite a few number of dropouts in secondary education, at least from my own experience. But um, you know, I I would also say that um, not majority of them definitely have not dropped out. Once they complete secondary education, their prospects of jobs uh, is much higher. Um, you know, people going into banking sector. We've really seen quite a number of few people going to hire senior senior positions, uh, both in the banking sector as well as the government sector. Um, and considering the quota system that's already prevalent in the country, not in the private sector, but in the government side, which is the civil service end, I would, I would really say um, the, the progressive nature of uh, girls graduating secondary education and going into civil service or even the private sector is, is definitely very high. The current, uh, actually this, this happened during the pandemic, uh, the biggest position held by uh, women in business is uh, becoming the president of uh, an association, uh, business association in Nepal, and it's a girl, right? She's a girl. Yeah. I mean, it's a she, um, and she says she's she's she. Um, but 
But definitely, and, and I think it's an inspiration to see, I think many girls take her as an inspiration because she's fought into, fought through the male-dominated society to actually do business and which is not really expected much in this country. So, you know, it's a maximum position held. Um, and, you know, I don't know how much you know, but we've, we had, a, we're so progressive that we've got a president with a female, but but that doesn't really say much. All in, I think to address your question directly, there's quite a quite a few number of um, girls, at least from the underprivileged families, that had to drop out of school because the families could no longer afford uh, the secondary education that they they would have had to give. Um, primarily because remittance was down. It can further give context on on how you know that really puts into puts into the whole picture is that uh, they can actually be brought back into education, um, and it just takes a few effort, right? So. I would definitely say people that make it to secondary education, girls or boys, would have a less likely chance of dropping out. That's it's already filtered, um, but it's more of a concern for girls that don't make it to secondary education because their their chances of employability or finding jobs that are decent um, and in the country is very 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 low. Um, if you are if you go into secondary education, you you definitely have place for yourself in the world. So just uh, just to kind of circle back again, you were talking about foreign investment and essentially the company's private investment in Nepal. Has this foreign investment helped provide any additional economic opportunities specifically for women in terms of, you know, I don't know, partnerships or also in terms of just extra employment, additional employment opportunities? No, I mean, so when I when I really said foreign aid and foreign investment is is primarily the reason the country has come up to the point it is because the government doesn't have the resources to invest in specific programs. Um, so we uh, one of the one of those one of the most successful programs ever introduced by a donor agency is something called Women's Group. Uh, and mothers group basically so mothers group are you know they were brought with the concept that women actually if they learn to control finances then families would be much well off and their children education would be an investment that families would make it started with that concept and today mothers group run cooperatives finance cooperatives mothers group run run businesses and it is not one, it's not two, it's not three. Like there are over, I think, 200 or 300,000 mothers groups that really have transformed communities. That's, in a, it's, it's a simple investment that the donor made, which was create a group, we'll give you a seed fund, and you do, you run the group this way, we'll train you. That I think one of the, one of the very things is if they really form the groups and they actually train people to run it. And these have evolved to become the center of development for most communities because women gather together and talk about issues in their families. They don't talk about issues in the community, but the families' issues being solved usually lead to issues in the communities being solved, education being one of those things. So UWS, um, which is my organization, we we work with, uh, with mother groups specifically when we build a school or when we actually think of building a school. We don't necessarily, we encourage male participants, but our contract and our our specific target groups are our mother groups, and so if they're on board, we usually have a very very successful school. When I say successful, I think we've got the highest. Currently, we've got 1.1 girl is to one one boy, and that's primarily attributed to women. Women have experienced what it is to not have education, and so these these mother groups are primarily the reason successes have come about. Foreign direct investment. This is all, uh, you know, when you work for a private company, there are so many different issues that comes with it. Culture is one of those. Um, families encourage their daughters to go work for different companies and organizations. But when, and the encouragement is only jobs that are closer to home. And if you want to go away from home, the encouragement is that you leave the country and go work in, uh, you know, some, if you're, if you're from another privileged family, you go and work in Dubai, Kuwait, Saudi, and all of that. If you're from a privileged family, 
you know, it's the same system. You don't go outside the district or the city to go and work. You go outside the country in Australia, Saudi, uh, sorry, Australia, US, Canada, all of those affluent countries. So female have it very difficult because it's a it's a du- dual role, right? So you've got a generation that doesn't encourage female that you know to go and work because these are the dominant voices in the families, and then you've got a generation that actually wants to go and work out. So uh, private companies definitely have come in and provided quite a lot of employment opportunities, both in the service sector as well as in the in the in the traditional sector. But uh, you know, depending on your education uh, education certificate and and level, you're offered jobs. Uh, but they're very city centric for women. They're very city centric people. People speci- specifically want everything close to home. But like I said, I think uh, the donor participation, both in terms of successful projects, is, is uh, there are two, which is one called, I don't know if you've heard about community forests, but community forests are led by women here in Nepal. And so that's, it's the, the, two, the two programs that have been hugely successful are protection of forest and protection of families and investment in families through mother groups. And these, if you, you know, if anybody searches on them, we've got, you know, over the past 10 years, we had huge increments in forest primarily because of the community forest groups that are led by women and, and mother groups are attributed to decrease in maternity, maternity rate. Um, they're attributed to increase in education for children investment. Um, they're attributed to child mortality, mortality rate decrease and all of that. And it's all because education to women is provided through these mother groups. The idea was that Finance is there, education piece is there, the training piece is there, but it's that mother group that really decided together. So I think I think there are successful examples. I mean, there are other examples that really didn't succeed, didn't, that they didn't really succeed. But I would definitely say this is these are one of those very few interventions that really succeeded in transforming communities. Okay. Thank you. So finally, I wanted to ask. Um, if you have any advice for organizations that are working to bring schools to rural communities and to talk a little bit about how you were able to develop the partnership with United World Schools to build the schools in rural Nepal. Um, so I, I happen to have established the organization in Nepal and one of the things I've learned is uh, you don't know everything. I think that's the first place to start. Um, I've, I've basically, you know, the first mistake I ever made was thinking I knew it. And early on, I realized that there were different actors in a community. And specifically, when you go to rural areas, it is more, culture is more ingrained in these societies. If you go to cities, uh, there's access to information. You can access quite a lot of information. And so you're continuously being bombarded with information in order to make a decision. These rural areas, whatever, whichever part of the world, uh, don't have access to information they can digest easily. And so therefore continuously make decisions based on the culture, tradition, and anything they've continued to live throughout their life or been informed by their families. And so when I went into these rural areas and said, I'm going to educate your children, and I know how to do it, they were like, well, you don't know how to do it. We know it. Um, I think I think it's very simple. Accepting that, but also knowing that if you can speak their language, which is basically form part of the part of the very group that you're going to serve, it is really important to understand the problem from the root rather than on the surface. Many programs and organizations have failed in delivering any goal mission actually on the field because they have not really understood the ground reality. What I really mean by this is, in paper, you can say you've educated 3,700 girls, but you can't really claim you've transformed the lives of these 3,700 girls because at the end of the day, the donors, yes, are interested in the numbers that you talk about, but you yourself, when you look back and then when you really think about the organization's success, then I guess at the end of the year, you have to see whether you've really transformed the lives of these communities and these families and these women and these girls or not. So I would really encourage, my encouragement is very simple. Um, focus on girls, but focus on community first. The community buy-in is crucial in order to create a long-lasting, sustainable solution to any problem that you're trying to solve, be it girls' education, building a school or anything. For us, every piece, when I really say every piece, for me, in order to build a bathroom, 
I have to, I make sure that the community investment is there. I don't really go and say, I'm going to build a bathroom for you because you need it. I tell them, do you need a bathroom? And they say, yes, we need a bathroom. Well, bring in a 30% investment and I will give you 70%. Now, the 30% does not really count as cash investment. They really come with labor in kind, material contribution, you know, mother's group activation. But then just because they say 30% I'll give you does not mean I'm going to build it. I really tell them, this is how it should be built. Are you okay with it? And if they say, well, we feel like this is probably might not work, then I usually take them on a story, right? I, you know, it's all about talking why it's important. It's about explaining them. Because if you take the time to explain them, it is not that they won't understand. It's that they take time to digest information. Right? Just because we went to school, then we can understand information, gather, understand the reason, you know, rationality behind anything we say it does not mean that these people understand it very easily. So. You know, we, we actually have more girls in school because we told the mother's group that if they were in their daughter's shoes, what is it, what is it one thing they would do? And all of them said, I would go to school. And I said, why don't you send your daughters to school? Then? Um, I think that was, a, that was a very, you know, I really hit, hit everybody's, uh, you know, thought process. And, and I think finally I would say bring in people that really understand uh, how to do it. Right? Like I said, I it's accepting you don't know is one thing, but bringing in people that know how to do it is another thing. And when you're going to rural areas, sitting in a city office and, and implementing a program is a terrible idea. Um, you definitely need to have your have your foots on the ground because girls are already vulnerable. And if you're controlling and implementing a program from, from far, you're really only encouraging the vulnerability. Uh, but if you're really out there implementing a program, you're really hitting the notes. You know how things work. You know how to tweak it. You know, you actually go and see it happening. And so therefore, you know, push that slight improvement of girls living and girls' lives by a certain inch. And that really puts it very, it's a lot of, you know, momentum to the improvement of uh, livelihoods and lives of the girls. So, and in order to improve a girl's life, I don't think... One of the most important things that we have to realize is make sure boys are forgotten because uh, because that's where the concern of these families are. Um, you know, if we are providing the best for the girls, then there's a likely chance that, you know, uh, families with boys might not feel very owned or might not feel part of the solution. So it's all about creating a balance. In order to get to your eventual goal, how do you play all the different cards and different? How do you ensure that all the variables uh, are put together in an equation to really eventually match it together? So, and and that's what we did really. Uh, convincing. I I really work with the government, so my my whole I sit on a, a, a committee called Committee for Improvement in Education, and there I advocate girls and tech. Um, because that's where my whole focus is. This country's economy, girls and everybody in tech is going to transform the country. So what I'm really saying is do not leave actors out because they might be, they are, they are a dominating force. Government, you can't neglect them. Work with them. Why go on a friction with them when you could work with them? They don't know how to do it. Teach them how to do it. It will take time educating them. All of these rural areas and the rural governments eventually want to learn and do and improve stuff for them, for these villages. It will take time explaining, but take your time. It's a very long process. Um, you know, you're transforming a culture. You're not transforming only one life. You're transforming this whole culture, thought process. And to do that takes quite a lot of energy and a lot of teamwork. Wow. So that was amazingly informative, Surya. It was, um, I want to thank you so much. Um, it's been really a pleasure speaking with you, having the opportunity to learn more about um, Nepal and girls and, and specifically your journey. Um, I would say to anyone on the call, if you'd like to share this conversation or listen to any of our other conversations about girls' education, you can visit our YouTube channel. And up next, we're going to be talking about education in Benin. 
So we invite your feedback. Um, hopefully there's a link to our feedback survey in the chat. And we thank you very, very much for joining you and uh, joining us and hope you'll join us again for future conversations. Again, thank you so much, Surya. Thank you, thank you for having me. I would, uh, I'm very honored. Um, I mean, uh, if you have any questions, any anything that I can help you guys with, answer or, or provide you any sort of resources I might have, which I don't think I have. But, uh, so please do get in touch uh, through Linda. And uh, I am on LinkedIn. I know there's quite a few of us connected on LinkedIn. And anything I can support you guys with or answer, help answer through your journey, I'm, I'm more than happy to do that. And uh, thank you, Linda, for thinking of me as you thought about the process of trying to learn about the work that I've done here. Um, it's an honor uh, to really, I, mean, I can't really see you, see you guys on, on video, uh, but uh, I can see you. I was late to the call. I'm, a, I'm apologetic on that part. But as this journey continues, please do let me know how I can support you guys. And Linda, kudos to you. Uh, the conversation you had in 2017, you really brought her uh, to implement the organization. That's really awesome. So, yeah, thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you for having me. Alrighty, thank you for joining us. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.